Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gabrielle Weimer, one of the co-founders of Mealflower, and it's my pleasure to be here with all of you today to talk about how edible insects can help improve food security. So as we've already touched upon today, food insecurity isn't just a challenge. In the US, 25% of the world's population is currently moderately or severely food insecure. And by looking at this map, we can see that a lot of that food insecurity is concentrated in low resource countries and countries that are going to be increasingly impacted by the effects of climate change. And this isn't just a problem today. This is going to be a problem that we need to continue to wrestle with in the coming years. By 2050, the global population is projected to reach 9 billion people. And that means that we're going to need to produce twice as much food and twice as much meat in order to meet the food demands of this growing population. At the same time, the global population is growing and the demand for food is increasing. We're also going to see the increasing negative effects of climate change. So extreme weather events like hurricanes and typhoons, along with droughts and fires, are going to negatively impact the agriculture and food production systems. And this is all going to lead to increasing food insecurity. So we need to identify the future of food. And the reason I'm here today is to talk about how edible insects fit into that. The catalyst for this conversation was really a 2013 report by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. And they really laid out how edible insects can be the future prospects for food and feed security. In the years since then, we've seen several publications from the BBC to the Washington Post to independent bloggers and even academic articles like this one from Indiana University a month ago that said that insects show promise as a good and sustainable food source. Now, I'm sure many of you watching might be a bit perplexed. Edible insects are not as common in North America, but the truth is 80% of the world already eats insects. There are countries in every continent where this is already a part of the diet. You can find crickets and grasshoppers in Mexico to silkworms in markets in Thailand. And not only do they taste good, but they also have a lot of other benefits. So the first, of course, is the nutritional benefits. Edible insects have just as much or more protein than traditional livestock, like beef or chicken. They also require a lot less water. So as we were talking about, with the increasing impacts of climate change and increasing droughts, we're really going to need to identify less water-intensive foods that can meet people's nutritional needs. And edible insects definitely fulfill that. Producing one pound of meat requires 2,000 gallons of water, whereas one pound of edible insects requires less than a gallon of water. And they're also much better for the environment in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So edible insects the, produce negligible amounts of greenhouse gases, which are the driver of climate change. Livestock, on the other hand, contributes 12 times as many greenhouse gases. And so edible insects can really be part of a sustainable and environmentally friendly food system. And there already are a lot of organizations and groups pushing this forward. We have companies like Entomo Farms, Aspire Food Group, and Kreka that are commercially producing insects and selling directly to consumers. And they're also making insect powders that can be incorporated into other food products. So maybe that's how some of you have tried insects before and insect protein bars or cricket chips. We also have companies like Livin Farms in Europe that produce tabletop farms that are, automate the insect farming process so that people can have them in their homes. And probably to many, to interest of many of you in the audience is the North American Coalition for Insect Agriculture. And this group is really driving forward the research and the advocacy in North America to make edible insects more acceptable and to also push the research around it so that we have the legislation in place and can make it accessible both for human consumption and for feed, since that's another area where edible insects have a lot of potential. But I'm here today to talk specifically about Mealflower, the organization that I co-founded with Elizabeth Frank and Joyce Liu. And before I tell you more about our work in Guatemala, I want to take a moment to hear from one of our program participants, Doña Irma. Creen que esos alimentos no se comen, que piensan que a esos animalitos solo son iguales los que están en la tierra, pero nuestros animales no son iguales con nosotros. Es eso en el que 
muchas, muchas personas quizás van a, a decir que no, que no, que eso no es correcto, que no es correcto que se lo den a los niños, pero yo creo que no, tiene que ser de, de primero de pensar en el futuro de nuestros hijos. Y eso es lo que hay que pensar en el futuro, en el futuro de los, nuestros niños. I couldn't agree more with Doña Irma. Thinking about the future and children's health is what really pushed us to start Neil Flower. Malnutrition is a huge problem in Guatemala. It has the sixth highest rate of chronic malnutrition in the world. And this problem is especially bad in indigenous communities where 70% of children are malnourished. And so when we were trying to think of a way to address this, we looked at what other organizations already were doing. And we saw that a lot of them were providing protein supplements. But this creates a dependence on aid and doesn't empower communities to take control of their nutrition. So we didn't think that this was a good model. It also contributes to waste. So having to package all of those protein powders and protein paste and then transporting them into communities both in urban and rural areas is not environmentally sustainable. The last program that we looked at were traditional livestock programs. So we had researched and learned about programs raising chickens and guinea pigs in Latin America, but those can often be too expensive and out of reach for communities that are food insecure and suffering from malnutrition. And as we discussed earlier, that's also not environmentally sustainable. So that's when we started trying to think about what could be an environmentally sustainable solution. And this is really critical in Guatemala because it's part of the dry corridor in Central America. And this is a geographic region that's been severely impacted by droughts. And in Guatemala, the population that's impacted by the dry corridor is 1.7 million people. And it's devastated agriculture there. And so we really needed to find a solution that wouldn't require a lot of water. And that could work in these different contexts in Guatemala. And that's how we came up with meal flour and realized that edible insects really do have the potential to meet the needs of these food insecure and malnourished communities. And our goal at meal flour is to empower communities to produce edible insects at home so that families can produce their own protein at home. So what we do is partner with local organizations and move communities through our training program. So we start by collecting recyclables or identifying readily available plastic containers. And then we teach people how to build mealworm farms. And what you see on the screen is exactly what a mealworm farm looks like. It's several layers of plastic bins that separate the different life stages of the mealworm, um, which is actually the larval stage of the darkling beetle. And so the darkling beetle goes in the top bin, which has some holes to allow the eggs to pass through. And then the eggs will hatch and the mealworms, as they grow, you separate them by size until they reach two centimeters in length. And at that point, they're ready to be harvested. And so harvesting just means taking the mealworms out, washing and roasting them, and then you can turn them into this protein-rich powder. And that's really critical because, as Doña Irma said, in, in some communities, there is an attrition of eating edible insects. It kind of depends on the region of Guatemala. Um, but by turning it into a powder, we're really able to increase the accessibility so that people can put it into the foods they're already making. The other benefit of mealworm farms is that the frass or mealworm waste product is a great fertilizer because it's really rich in nitrogen. And so that means that these families, a lot of times, who already have at family gardens, community gardens, can use this frass to help them grow fruits and vegetables. So we do all of this through a training program in partnership with local community organizations. And we go through all of these different classes in the program. So we always start off with an introduction to mealworms and the importance of protein. And of course, we always bring along samples. So we make some mealworm cookies or other things that the women can try. So they really can get a taste of the program, both literally and metaphorically. And once we explain the benefits of it and why protein is so important, we see lots of excitement and interest in joining the program. And that's really important to us because this is really participatory. After we get women to sign up for the program, we go through a couple of other classes. So we talk about how to build and set up the mealworm farm, how to maintain it. And this part is really critical because we use what's called a train the trainer model. And so we're training community leaders so that they eventually can go on and train other members of their community and allow the program to continue growing and reaching more families that are affected by food insecurity and malnutrition. 
We're also working with translators since we're working in indigenous communities where Spanish isn't the main language. So it's really important to us to get that feedback and input. And one of the key ways that we do that is through home visits and focus groups. So we really bring the program to where women are. And COVID has definitely thrown a wrench in that. There are lockdowns in Guatemala as well, but we've been able to call the women in our programs. They're sending us pictures on WhatsApp of their farms, which has allowed us to keep up to date with them and give them advice on things that they can do. And then the last class, which is of course the most fun and most delicious, is our cooking class. So we go over how to produce the mealworm powder and then make a recipe that's common to the area of Guatemala where we're working. And while our focus at Mealflower is Guatemala, that's where we have strong implementation partners, that's where we know the context, we do believe that there is a huge potential to scale this globally. And we've already been partnering and collaborating with organizations in Uganda and Zambia and Madagascar to bring this idea of edible insects addressing food insecurity to more communities. And so you can see that our training materials have made it all the way to Uganda, where our handouts were used to explain the mealworm life cycle. And it's really critical that we scale this worldwide. There's food insecurity in all of the countries that we saw earlier, both in urban and rural areas. And I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, point out one of our key partners in these efforts, which is Mighty, the mission to improve global health through insects. And they've really been key in identifying some of the next steps, which is where I'm hoping some of you can get involved in the future of food. So our partner, Valerie Stull at Mighty, is already leading a lot of the research around edible insects and their health and nutritional impacts. But we do also need more research on the best farm models and how we can adapt it to different materials and climates. Which brings us to the second point in terms of things that we need. We need more programs in diverse areas. If this is going to be a global solution, we need to start testing and collecting data on how programs like Mealflower work in different areas. And as all of this is happening, we need to maintain the focus on local farms. We really need to empower the communities and families that are suffering from food insecurity to produce their own source of nutrition. Thank you.